Hey everybody and welcome back to Industry Night with me, Nikki Nellis, the show that takes you on the deep dive of everything happening in the food, wine, and hospitality scene, especially in the DC market, especially on today's show. So, with me, lucky me, here I am at the gorgeous wine lair, this fabulous wine club in the heart of DC, right next door to the Ritz-Carlton. If you have not had an opportunity to come here, I highly recommend it, but you can't just walk in need a secret code, which means you need to reach out to me so I can help you out. Um, but it is beautiful, great place for lunches and dinners, private events, and they have an amazing wine cellar, which my two guests just saw today, where people are keeping not just their wines, but also their spirits too. So definitely come and check it out. If you're new here, thanks so much for joining me. A bit about me. I've been covering the DC food and wine scene for the last 20 years. You read the list, are you on it.com, the online e-zine that tells you everything that's happening in the DC metro area, openings, promotions, and every food and wine event, including all those glitzy galas, which are coming up this summer. Uh, you listen to me and my husband, David, every Sunday at 11 a.m. on 1500. Foodie and the Beast, almost 15 years old. Um, so don't miss anything like of that because it is DC's only food and wine variety show. Of course, you follow me at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and now YouTube. You should totally be subscribing because not only am I out and about in the DC metro area, but I'm doing a lot of amazing travels and you definitely want to stay tuned because I'm going to the James Beard Award in two weeks. And not only am I in attendance of all the fabulous parties and events, but I am also so one of the hosts on the red carpet. So I will be interviewing all the famous people and all the fabulous wares and finding out what they're up to. So definitely stay tuned for that kind of content. Okay, so as I do on every show, I tell you about where I've been eating and your girl likes to eat a lot and drink a little bit. So uh, let's see, Frankly Pizza is in Kensington, Maryland. It's around the corner from my house. I go there way more than I should. But the other night we had to do some entertaining last minute, which I was not prepared for. We just called the team there and they brought over all the goods. They do Neapolitan pizza, so it's definitely soupy in the middle, but the products they use are so pristine and the pizza holds so beautifully. They also do gorgeous salads and um, really beautiful tiramisu. I'm so fortunate to have that within walking distance of my house. Uh, I got a special invite from the ambassador of Georgia, not the state, the country, for a Georgian wine tasting at the Library of Congress. I was just, you know, hobnobbing with those ambassadors, drinking fabulous Georgian wines. And if you're not familiar with the wines, you should really check them out. Um, I personally cannot pronounce any of the names, so I'm not going to I'm not going to take anybody down that road, but um, their sparklings are beautiful and uh, their rosés are um, really comparable to some of the best of Provence. Um, so if you haven't had an opportunity, check that out. I was delighted to be there. I had dinner at La Colina up on Capitol Hill. You may not be familiar with it because it's on the back end of the Duck and the Peach. So Hollis Silverman owns three restaurants, one attached to each other, Duck and the Peach, her cocktail bar, The Wells, and then then uh, La Colina, her little Osteria. It's such a darling little neighborhood joint. I'm sorry it's not in my neighborhood, but we were delighted to go there. And then lastly, I finally made it out to Mosaic. I don't cross the river as much as I should to check out what Rose Previtt is doing at Kirby Club, her new place. You know Rose, she um, has made down here in DC. She is a Michelin starred restaurant owner and Kirby Club really is doing incredible things. All the mezzas, they're so yummy and delicious. Um, they do this spicy green hummus, which I've never had before um, and it's really delicious. I don't love the pita because I like mine puffy and light, but it is perfect to uh, swap up all that yummy hummus. Um, but they're doing shish kebabs and they are incredible. So we got one, it's like shish kebabs for the table. So it's one of everything. And then these massive ribs, they look like Fred Flintstone stuff. Um, so much fun. Um, there's no pictures of me tearing into that, uh, which is unfortunate for you because it's kind of funny. Um, so let's see. Oh, other than that, just only go to Kirby Club with people you love because um, everybody smells of garlic afterwards, uh, but definitely worth the trip. Check it out. Okay, so enough about me. Now on to today's shows. Um, well, a little bit more about me because I'm going to talk about how I met the both of them. So, I met the Wilder brothers, Ari and Ari and Micah, um, a really long time ago, and I think I met you first. I think I met Ari uh, back when you were at Zola. Yeah. 
Possibly. Um, like I was just getting back into the business. I was just starting in my business. Um, remember Zola? So was I. God, I love Zola. Yeah, Zola was so, so much great. fun. Um, right next to the Spy Museum. Anyway, it's not there anymore. Um, but you two, as I digress, uh, you two in the early aughts, you were part of this cocktail renaissance that was happening, not just here in DC, but it was national, right? There was this huge wave of interest in making cocktails better, understanding the history of cocktails, creating products that made the cocktails taste better and were better for you, um, a real interest in integrity. Um, so you made your names, thanks to that commitment, to both products, they found an old product of theirs, um, that they were developing, but also the projects you were doing around the city. So you were consulting with a bunch of people, like the Jeff Blacks of this world. Um, you've come on Foodie and the Beast thousands of times. Um, later in the show, we'll talk about the one time you came on Foodie and the Beast that you do not remember at all, <laughs> because you don't remember. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Um, and now you guys are behind Chaplins. You're behind Zeppelins. But you also have your own projects that you're working on. Um, you're working with the team behind Love Mikado, uh, which I love and I talked about last week. You are behind the new Little Gem Capo, which I also love mm -hmm. and I talked about last mm -hmm. week. Um, and I feel like I knew you guys when you were babies and now you <laughs> both have babies. And um, I'm just so excited to talk to you about both of your histories, um, sort of your trajectories and what's on the horizon. So, hi. How are you doing? That's, I cannot believe you have that box. I know. Yeah, so crazy. Back, just the label and design. Bring it's back still beautiful. Look how great it looks. It's fabulous. Well, I was like peddling stuff out of our kitchen. Mm -hmm. So we were like we're little, little we were like cocktail home. gypsies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's kind of start there. Micah, you're the older of the two. Mm -hmm. So let's start with you. How did you wind up in the cocktail biz? Because you were out west, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. I um, I went back, like we were back and forth, San Francisco and D.C. our whole life. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to uh, to art school in San Francisco and Ari stayed here uh, to go to Maryland for mm -hmm. econ. And, um, and so, yeah, I was out there and just kind of uh, studying visual effects and graphic design as like uh, the cocktail scene was kind of, you know, just starting like you had said like this new kind of like interest in like you know uh this renaissance like you know like going back to the roots of like savoy and like all these cocktail books that had been kind of like collecting dust um in the dark ages of like the but, 80s and but 90s. don't you think like in the 80s i think of the 80s yeah. specifically like it wasn't about producing a good cocktail it was about speed it was about how fast can i get that cocktail to the person at the bar because i want to make the next cocktail it was more about volume than it was about the craft it was also about like you know the experience which is what it's always been about right mm -hmm. i mean it was about like you know those people like you had to have a reputation to like work at some of these bars and you had to have style and had to have like connections and a name to like even get a job at like the cooler places, you mm -hmm. know, and that was kind of like, it was just more of like being part of the scene um, and less about like the quality of the cocktails, like you're saying, like, just, right. so obviously Cause I was a part of the scene. I was yeah. just on the other side of the bar, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? but obviously to appeal to any owner, you better be capable of volume, right? I right. Mean, really yeah. From an owner's perspective. Like, okay. But so then when did that shift for you? When were you like, when did you drink a cocktail and you're like, oh my God, this actually tastes good. I'm not just drinking it for the buzz it's going to give me. I'm drinking it because it's tasty. Like who inspired you? I would say uh, it was around the time like Bourbon and Branch opened in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, our friend Naya White was like, uh, like opened, opened the bar program there and um, and we would just hang out with him at the bar. There's like this Tommy guy and you had to go through the library door and we'd just sit at his bar and he'd make us like tons of, uh, he called them derbies back then, but like um, I went on, we still have that drink on the menu at Chaplin's, we call it a tramp. Mm -hmm. And it's really simple. It's just kind of like a, basically like a Monte Carlo with bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, but okay, but, you say that like everybody knows what a Monte Carlo. Yeah, is. so What's a Monte Carlo? so generally, yeah, like uh, they, so it's like just uh, the Tramp is just bourbon, Peychaud's, uh, Peychaud's bitters, and uh, Benedictine. Okay. With like you know some orange oil, or sometimes some people like to burn the orange in the nose. It's uh-huh. really nice if you do it properly. Um, but then I, he was like, you know, building juleps properly, like letting them in, like sit in the, like he'd have them all lined up. And it, there was just like this kind of like, uh, this just, uh, he was just kind of like really, really just in love with what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't And about, were you with him at this time? <clears throat> I mean, I used to, like I, Mike introduced me to cocktails and they certainly weren't really prevalent in DC, mm-hmm. like not classics and not like at craft and so i used to go out to san francisco a lot and we used to snowboard in tahoe together and he would usually starting he started getting me into bartending and he i would like guest bartend with him at places so we could pay for the trip afterwards and he would take me to uh, all yeah, these like awesome do, places like, he used to work at the phoenix hotel with me for, yeah, like, for like the, the wet parties at yeah. the rock and roll hotel like mm-hmm. in, uh that I worked at for like seven years, and that was like originally like Chip Connolly's okay. like first hotel before wow. he like started, you know, his whole uh, his whole uh, like boutique hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so everything's starting to change, right? Yeah, the like we look just, of luxury is changing. Yeah. That's all changing. Well, I would come back. To, I would go to trips in San Francisco, and I would come back from San Francisco and just be like, you know, San Francisco, like the bar scene there compared to what the scene was here. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was right. like polar opposites, right? Mm-hmm. Like there were there weren't like people in suits, you know, drinking lemon drop martinis and like blob and coffee. Yeah. Hey, hey I understand those are coming back in. But yeah, go ahead. Everything's coming back. <laughs> yeah. Um so you know, I would come back just like inspired, mm-hmm. right? But like, you know, I didn't still didn't know much about it. And I was just starting to bartend and you know, I was like learning what people were teaching me. But every time I went to San Francisco to see Micah and like hang out with all of his friends that were all in the industry, like everywhere you went, it was like this celebrity kind of like notoriety for all of them in that city Mm -hmm. where like, you know, they were getting into places that like celebrities weren't getting into because they knew everyone there. And it was just like a scene to me that I was getting exposed to that was so inspiring and like fun and exciting that right, that's, but, but to me you're both young at this point right yeah. i mean not that you're not young now but you know what i mean like no, you're I'm young not. you're partiers <laughs> like okay. you're out you're bartenders you're drinking i mean to me you're partying right so this is part of the party so at what point do you realize hey not only can i party as my profession but i can serve something really solid like where was that shift for you i mean we grew up as like vegetarians and like where our mother like you know like taught us a lot about just like basic like making your own medicines ingredients like Mm -hmm. so like a lot of that kind of like between that and like the creative process and just like the like the artsy you know aspect of like just who we were Mm -hmm. we just and just how socially like involved we were and how we thrived on that like social energy it just kind of made perfect sense for us. Like, so yeah. how did you come back here and sell yourselves? Like, did you come back as a duo and you were like, hey, we have something to offer that's different than what you're doing? The like, convers- let's talk like Zola. Like, is that yeah. what you both were? The conversation was like, originally we were like, are we going to open in San Francisco yeah. or are we going to open in Washington, D.C.? Right. Okay. That was like, and I, you know, I obviously wanted to move there. And Micah wanted to stay there, but we felt like we had, like our parents were here and we had resources here that we felt that maybe would help us, you know, help propel us opening our own cocktail consulting company where we would make our own mixers and bitters, et cetera, and work on like, you know, doing beverage programs for people. And, but at the same time we had to get, I, first of all, I had to convince Micah to move from San Francisco, but right. I, I, which I, was I, like, I, <laughs> very, yeah, very hard. long like drawn out here. life was that's why I mean, people live there like you know forever and they never like change what they're doing for like right 20 decades they do the same thing because this lifestyle the quality of living in that demographic yeah. is so awesome right, right. you know yes so. but you did come back here i did and i was excited to kind of like 
you know, DC wasn't where San Francisco was, obviously, at that time. So well, there was more opportunity. Here yeah, well, somewhere. don't you feel like not only was there more opportunity, because probably when you guys were starting, you know, Todd Thrasher had already opened up PX. Yeah, yeah. So, like, we had the first, like, sprinkling of speakeasies. Do oh, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, it's all starting. Yeah. But also, I find with DC, and I speak to this from my own personal experience, like, I didn't think I was ever going to stay in D.C. I always assumed yeah, I'd be back in New York neither. City. But I I would be one of thousands in New York with mm-hmm. what I do. Mm-hmm. Here I'm one of a couple. So, All you right. know, it is a smaller pond yeah. and you can be a bigger fish. It's, yeah. so much more, it's so much more exciting to pioneer something. Right. Than to be in that huge pool with people that are doing so many different things that you kind of, you definitely get lost right. in that for sure. So. so when you started your business together, what did that look like? I mean, I remember it, but I, you know, when I think back to like press releases that came out on you both, you know, nobody were like, they didn't use the term consultants. No. They made like you were, we were there, bartenders. like you were bartenders, yeah. but you were bartending. I was like, how many places can these guys be oh, at? You were bartending gosh. everywhere, right? Yeah. So how did you market yourself? How did you... How did you start that? Yeah, I think that like the key for us was to like create a brand uh, where, you know, like if as a consultant, right, like you, you go into a lot of these places, you, you create a really awesome program, you train the staff Mm -hmm. and you dial it in and then your, your, your time's up and you roll and usually it takes a couple of months for the program to completely fall apart, but like <laughs> then they'll keep your name on it for another right. year or two right. until they're right. beating a dead horse in the ground. And all the while, all these people are going by tasting your cocktails, which aren't even really being executed properly. So, but how did you? I guess what I want to know is like how did what's, you, like what? How did you sell started? the concept? Well, no, but like think about it. Like, <clears throat> listen, if you worked at Zolo, you worked with Dan Meshes and Rob Rosenberg, right? Yeah. And those are guys who really understood what was happening. They had their yeah. finger on the pulse of what was changing in the DC market. They Maybe they didn't hit the ball over the fence with Potenza, but Zola really was changing a lot yeah. of things, how people ate, how people dined, right. and what was happening behind the bar. So I could see you saying to them, like, this is the kind of cocktail program you should have. So the how, so Rob what had happened? a history in San Francisco, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. so I was, yes, so Rob, I was learning Ralph was like a mentor to me for the beverage and wine side, cocktail side. And while I was learning and, and working at Zola, because I opened Zola and worked there pretty much until we did the beverage program and closed it mm-hmm. pretty much like almost nine years or whatever. But during that period, Micah was still in San Francisco doing a ton of places there and, and developing and evolving in San Francisco. And then we were like starting to conjure up this idea with a lot of people's, you know, a lot of people, people's input encouraging us to kind of, you guys should do something together because we are like best friends and we did everything together anyway, mm-hmm. but we were on opposite sides of the coast. And, you know, eventually it, it just kind of worked out that Micah was like, okay, well, if we're going to do this, why don't, you know, my parents really wanted Micah to move back so he, he could be close to them too. Mm-hmm. And he like eventually kind of like dragged him back from San Francisco to here and then started he started bartending with me at different places and we you know as we were working together at different places we were starting to hatch this plan of like you know starting to make these mixers whatever that mostly were inspired by micah and like you know his ideas and then i think i was sort of a glorified bar back at that point but like you know we were doing stuff like we were living together so we were making things in our kitchen and saucepans and whatever and we were also commercial licensing yeah we were learning from all these chefs that we were inspired by but you you couldn't like you couldn't like google like how to make a tonic right right that wasn't there or like we were just it was like like, trial and error we still don't know what a gum syrup is go ahead yeah right that's kind of how i mean it was really literally hatched like in our like tiny little apartment kitchen which is actually Partially now, one of them was across from where Zeppelin literally was right across from right across the street on Ninth. So you were like early pioneers. We were there in long Shaw. before. Well, Chaplin's was still a used car lot. Okay, Zeppelin was pretty much falling and down. Then, right, yeah. and, and that guy were, that that had opened Shaw Bijou with right. Kame, uh the Kelly. owned the salon. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Kelly, right? Yeah, yes. he was living there with his you know not so nice dog. 
Yeah. And he was rebuilding <laughs> and he was rebuilding the, the building. And Mike and I were watching all of it. We were like, first of all, the corner where Chaplin's was, we were like, that would be such an awesome corner. Mm-hmm. Like we love this area. And then we were looking at Zeppelin. We were like, wow, like that place looks more like a bar than a house. Like we should, I wish we could have that one day, blah, blah. And like, you know, fast forward 10 plus years later, Chaplin's and then Zeppelin. And that was completely organic. I but mean, yeah, but I mean, we did skip through like, you know, a lot of these chefs, like Jeff Black, Robert Wiedemeyer, like those guys, like really kind of helped us. POGs. Yeah, like helped us come up and really kind of saw something unique in us. And like, and we learned a lot from them as well, like on all those projects. That's kind of my question. So let's use Robert Wiedemeyer and Jeff Black, both really savvy businessmen Mm -hmm. when it comes to running their restaurants Mm -hmm. um, with two very different kinds of kinds of restaurants, you know, concepts. But was it a heavy lift to sell them what it was going to take to raise their cocktails? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. they didn't value the wine. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, they valued wine. The they ingredients, could wine. Like the yes. ingredients were That's expensive. I mean. The things we wanted to work with were expensive. We still didn't really have any idea about the cost. We weren't like of we cost were versus coming profit from the creative and, and innovative and right. not like. We hadn't like, you know, grown up enough to really fully understand like the full spectrum like the of you. Right. You know? Not even close. Okay. And and also like the heavy lifting that went into like that bottle, for example, the way that we were making things back then, you know, we were buying tree sap and grinding it down in like little stone bowls instead of buying the powder to make the gum. So if you were watching on YouTube, you can see I have one of their original products that they gave me. It's 15 (laughs) years old. It's called Wilder Brothers Craft Black Birch Gum, G-O-M-M-E. Yeah. And what was the significance of making a gum? Or you were just like, let's just do it. It was like started off with a Pisco Punch, which Mm -hmm. is like an original San Francisco cocktail, like, and the gum syrup is like a lost ingredient. Uh, pineapple gum is like, a, like really uh, just adds like kind of a silky viscosity mm. to the drink. Um, it's a subtle, it's a subtle. But um, you would use very little of this, yeah. right? Like it's just like an like essence. Like literally like a quarter of an ounce. Mm. But like getting people, but like working with programs and getting people like, you know, in like for Robert Wiedemeyer, we went out to the Rebel Resort and like to Atlantic City or whatever, and we were doing. Uh, oh my God, I remember there. when that out opened. Uh, yeah. I know. That, that was, was insane. Shame. Ari and I used to like, yeah, we worked all day and then spent our nights at the showboat, like yeah. drinking martinis, yeah. watching shady. Watching people with cigarettes like, and ashes strange. this long in their mouth. Yeah, like <laughs> pulling the. Um, but that, that was a long, yeah, Atlantic City, that Rebel never really uh, took so, off, Well, because. So. Uh, oh, yeah. 2008, yeah. we had the recession it, it and it tanked yeah, everything. Really unfortunate. Yeah. But it was yeah. a really cool project. And what we learned from that and also, and really any other projects that we were starting to work on was that, you know, doing these cocktails the way we wanted to do them, mm-hmm. requiring these ingredients that were kind of hard to find and like very hard to turn into what, you know, we wanted to use in our cocktails and such if leaving them to do it without us, it was pretty much like not, it was going to fail. Right? Okay. Like they, it was too much work and it was asking people that aren't chefs to be chefs. And bartenders right? that had never measured a drink in their life right. to like right. start like before like measuring a drink was even like an industry standard, which obviously it is now, thank God. But like back then it was like, no, it was actually arms. looked down upon. Yeah. It was like, like why people you thought like you were uh, being insulting chintzy. them, yeah. yeah, or chintzy, right? Yeah. Right. Well, okay, so you are at these restaurants now. You're executing your program. You mer- you live in Shaw, and you see the two spaces, right? Yeah. The Shaw Bijou space and the Chaplin space. Mm-hmm. So how do you go from um, we're spirits guys, we do cocktails, to restaurant owners? Because a lot you of falling just... down our face. Yeah, a okay, lot of. A lot of that and like yeah but a like, lot of programs for other people a lot of running other people's programs and and not really asking for compensation because we are just still bartending and slinging our some of our own drinks as well as making money for people that we worked for and we are happy doing it mm-hmm. but you know also our parents kind of being like you know 
what's the next step? Like, right, are you guys, way. you know, are you guys going to do this forever? Which is fine. There wasn't really a lot of pressure, but like, or are you going to get serious and do something together and what's it going to be? And so, you know, over time, like that question keeps getting asked and asked and eventually you start. Did you find it insulting? Were you like, I have a job. I'm you, I mean, the consulting point, started yeah, like, to like yeah. make us realize that there was more to. It also taught us a lot. It taught yeah, us like, for sure. it taught us how um, undervalued beverage was yeah. in the equation of a restaurant mm-hmm. and how you could double your money. If you really put as much emphasis on beverage as you did culinary, it's like, yeah. then yeah. and that's kind of I know. like think a win-win. Think about what cocktails cost today. Yeah. I know. I mean, it's thank crazy. You. I guess we should say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're still the trying to keep it, the we're still trying to keep it underneath, <laughs> yeah. like low. It's, good, it's, uh, it's getting yeah. harder and harder, but we're still. Okay, so trying. what was the vision? Let's walk through Chaplin's and Zeppelin's. What was the vision? And I know you guys are brothers and and best friends, but was it hard to execute a restaurant, a vision together? And it, it's more than a bar because there's food there. You brought in a chef. How did you guys come up with what you were looking to do there? It's just a full of I, full of challenges, obviously. Like, I mean, we developed Chaplin's as like an open ended concept. Um, so that being said, it was like based. What does on, that mean, open ended? Like, concept? so that we could have gone with any in any culinary direction. It was mm-hmm. like frag. It was like piece. It was it was moving very fast, mm-hmm. right? Like we, you know, there was this place called Mandalay where Chaplin's is now, and. You know, one of our friends, Jordan, who works for a distributor, knew that, you know, Ong, the owner of Mandalay, was looking at potentially, you know, selling the space because he didn't want to do Mandalay there because it just wasn't the right time. And Mm -hmm. he introduced us and we went over and checked out the space. And it was this beautiful three level space with all this light. And it was the actual looking. It was new, but it had walls everywhere. And we were like, we saw a huge. I mean, this is where we wanted to be. Sean was, was where we lived. It was with a like, big patio, and like, and we just kind yeah. of started rolling. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have any investors. We weren't planning on trying to find any. We and, had, like we had a whole like stack of concepts to match up to like the building, the right? space, like, like so, the right space. Yeah. And okay. this space felt like the, the like the theatrical kind of silent film concept that we were looking to do. It had the vertical space where we could do project projections, projections black and whites yeah. and stuff like that. And then our partner, Adrian, that is, you know, the, our, our main partner was really loved ramen and he loved going to this place. And, and actually, eating. I was going to say at that time, there was no ramen in the city. No, not really. Where'd I mean, he go? Yeah. He went to Renz. He went to yeah, Renz to Ramen and that's and where that's we where got it. Chef yeah, Mio Chef was. Mio. And we, you know, and uh, interestingly enough, Wait, our... Sh- the chef was from Renz. So yeah, Mio was, worked at Renz. Oh we, we it was his ramen partnership. I and have no and idea. then our land, our landlord Ung, who owned Mandalay, yeah. he's Burmese. Okay. Yeah. And Mio's originally from Burma, and Ung's wife went to school with Mio. With Mio yeah. in Burma. So he, we were mm-hmm. met talking about doing ramen, and we were Adrian kept saying how he really wanted to do this ramen place. Where could we do it? Where could we do it? And he was asking Ong and telling Ong his favorite place was out in Ren's Ramen. So we went there one day, saw a line down the block. Right, in between cash only. 7-Eleven and a gas station yeah. and a strip mall. Yeah. And we were like, in the, like the, on like a Tuesday, and we were like, we had the food, and we were like, this is incredible. When mm-hmm. can we meet him? And we sat down with him at the Mandalay in Silver Spring, Ong's like family restaurant. Right. Had a big round table, had a bunch of awesome Mandalay. Um, like food from there and Burmese food and we told him that we wanted him to be our partner but that we had no interest in Americanizing any of his food Smart. and that he was in charge of the kitchen we were in charge of the front and like we would just collaborate together and we didn't even have to talk money as soon as he heard that it would be all him all in- his recipes all his ingredients the way he wanted it and then he had people to operate and serve his food it was mm-hmm. like a union and that was kind of like the so. way we saw it. Like they, to this day, they're they're his family's recipes. Yeah, and our family. So it's kind of like our family in the front of the house with our recipes, and mm-hmm. his family in the back of the house. And we translated, you know, because we built our restaurants around our bars. Right. 
or our, our bars, our bars our are, you know, our restaurants are around our bars. Like our bars are the center of our. But the food world. is usually like the inspiration for what we're doing. Yeah. But well, I mean, that's what I was going to ask. Because, so, yeah. like, to me, when I think of Chaplains, yeah. I mean, it's a party place. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a huge singles place. Like, lots of people, all my single friends go it's there. It's the cheers of shop. <laughs> that's like, what Jeff calls. Uh, like so a younger version. But yes, yeah, a younger, a younger version. version. But like that's where all my single friends go. Like yeah, they go there to right. hang out. Right? And then they come back after they've gotten married for and they do like and engagement they do parties. engagement or oh, no, they wow. do like their anniversaries. anniversaries. Yeah, oh, it's amazing. Really nice. see, yeah. Yeah. That is nice. It's very cool. Yeah, having like, a like, very like, oh, honey, remember that, when I grew up over there? Right. Yeah. It was like. There's a lot of nostalgia for sure for a lot of. So people. how does that evolve? The restaurant's been open for almost ten years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do you book? And so ten years ago when you opened, neither of you were married. Neither of you had kids. All right. So how does it evolve for you running that restaurant, keeping it fresh, well, we keeping added it a part kids of this thing? Yeah, okay. a couple of years ago, which is going great for all of our children and uh-huh. all of our well, friends. Well, and like that that neighborhood, like you know, also has changed. just grown so much since like. When we were first opening, people thought we were kind of crazy. crazy. Like they were like, there was, nothing there. there was no Uber. Like you couldn't right. get. Tom, you got dropped off by a cab there. That cab was not picking seen, you back. Yeah, yeah like Tom. So you have to walk quarter or down drive. the street, but that was it. Right. Right. You know? Right. Well, all those new buildings. I mean, what's Marriott across? was just sitting. City market it out. Right, but like none of yeah, that whole area did we not were exist. Super lucky, but like that was well, City market was open. pretty much like the residents. In those buildings, we yeah, like supported our everything. business for yeah. two years until yeah. people started coming. And we were very, very lucky. We mm-hmm. were very good relationships and met so many amazing people that all took a chance to live there in those beautiful buildings. But also, right. we were the only place for them to really yeah, go. Yeah, we were, when we're they directly across came along. from their entrance. So. Yeah. I mean, we think about it. There wasn't really Uber lucky. Eats. Like, there wasn't Nothing. a lot of ways to yeah. get your food. I mean, we met can. some of our regulars from across the street would live there for so long. We used to just hand deliver their food to them because we were like, I mean, yeah. they were like our support, you know, right. they might as well have had snow days you know, where the house best. Oh, so, I yeah, They all came over on snow days and yeah. just like, City living. Blast. Yeah. And it definitely went. You know, we when we opened Chaplin's, like combining a ramen house with a cocktail bar and, you know, doing it in that space that way. Thank God we had Swatch Room, Maggie and Warren. Yeah, and like to, Maggie was to, just to, right, like a half a block down in her mm-hmm. studio. She lived, yeah, they lived across the street. Their studio was on the same street. Swatch Warren lived across like, yeah. on the other corner. Like, so mm-hmm. they, this was also like an investment for we them. We were so lucky. Because they though. wanted something in the neighborhood. So we kind of like... It was definitely a collaboration. You know, mm-hmm. Maggie and Warren definitely did not charge us enough for putting up with what they had to put Well, up they had brought a whole over, league. That was back when Swatch was like, they brought a whole league of artists, artists to like paint certain. our walls instead yeah. of putting up and all painting paper. everything. I mean, wow. the motif but that's on when the bar she, was This is Maggie O'Neill. I mean, yeah. this yeah. is when she is also percolating, right? 100%. And she is just, now she's Maggie O'Neill. And right, then, you right. know, having a piece of artifice yeah. is totally different or having her yeah. in your restaurant is totally right. different. So, was, I mean, right place, right time. It yeah. was great to be like, take this brand new building and make it look like you're stepping into the old world, like mm-hmm. into a black and white film. But like we have all the modern amenities of a of a new building, like an like elevator, the glass, for the right. elevator, right? <laughs> like so, it was like, like it was perfect for you know for like the face of the business and then to function because without an elevator, I don't know how we could run a hot ramen up and down the street. No the floors, right? Ladders, like right. Like okay, floor. so then how did you guys fall into the defunct Shabiju? So we had been talking for a while about doing a sushi, a Zeppelin concept first. Mike and I and my dad initially about a it long was going to go on top of Chaplin's, mm-hmm. which is what we and really it was meant wanted. to be like symbolic, like a Zeppelin floating above, above Chaplin's Chaps, during yeah. the okay. same era kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then we right. just like the people that opened after Shah Bijou closed, French Quarterie, French Quarter Brasserie opened. And okay, what did that? That was like thirty seconds. It was not very long, but it was yeah. long enough for the GM and the people that work there and the owners of that space, French Quarter, to come over a lot and started talking about how they wanted to sell and like and how it was, much money they wanted. And, and we fell in stuff. love with that building. We like, loved let's the just space. Be real. Well, it's an amazing we, space. We were just like, we, we were doing some, it, we are constantly 
going back to all the new walking owners, down the street, like, walking checking it out. Street, like, mm-hmm. like, we really it was wanted an ongoing, and we yeah. had been we had been a lot of developers that we had met with out in Mosaic and all over the city that we're at looking at it. us coming to like the wharf and blah, blah blah, and we would do the drive and we'd see how challenging it would be for us to be involved like we're involved in our places and be driving all over the city and like a blah, show blah, blah, right yeah. you know and we just didn't we just didn't see that for ourselves we wanted to be still behind our own bars and on our floors and it was all like, the time. like the neighborhood kind of like aspect of shaw and mm-hmm. like mixed with the high density buildings yeah and it's, and it's like so residential house. like yeah. the residential side of it is what we've always wanted we've always wanted to be neighborhood neighborhood places We've wanted to see the same people over and over again. We've wanted to make an impact in an area that is underserved in certain areas. And we had, you know, five years of asking our regulars at Chaplains what else they wanted in this in this area. And right. We sushi. got a resounding yeah with sushi. Yeah, yeah. and Everybody we were sushi. initially we were afraid like we were going to cannibalize our clientele by opening a Big block time. away. That was and like so a like huge concern. We tried to do things too differently at Zeppelin in the beginning. And then we realized like the, 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 the cuisine is so different mm-hmm. and like, we're, we're not going to, we just need to remember who we are, that we're, that we're just an, a, a fun neighborhood gathering and that's casual and approachable and like, yeah, we're going to serve the best day. product we can at like the best price. Yeah, but not only me. that, by the time you guys opened up Zeppelin's and since that opening, I mean, the residential spring up had blossomed, around you. Yeah. I mean, had you've really got like blossomed, all those apartment sure. buildings. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, the hotel. The, I think the challenges still are, though, like, you know, in D.C. going through this whole evolution of, you know, the like, you know, revitalizing and developing, et cetera. There's all of these neighborhoods that never existed, right? right? Yeah. And so you're so you are spreading out a population that used to only have like you know three to four areas and now have. I mean, I don't even know the names of some of the neighborhoods now. No, I'm no, like, no. I mean, like we. No, no, no. I mean, like, listen. When I first moved down here 30 years ago, it was you know Cap Hill, Dupont, Georgetown, Foggy Bottom. Adams Morgan, so that was kind you of know, it. that was kind of it. Yeah, and yeah. now, you know, I remember the first time somebody told me about LaDroit, I was like, no, I know. where is that? Right. Or, or Shaw or Bloomingdale or Navy Yard, right. or now it's Union Market District. You I know? mean, Columbia Heights emerged after a while, but like right. there's so many areas that have evolved since then. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful because for the residents and for the people surrounding DC that are coming into the city, they have more variety and they have all these cool areas and boroughs and stuff like that where we never had before which really like despite the fact that it's spread out the population of diners and consumers whatever it's also added to the like intrigue of dc which well, is vibrant, what we want but right? honestly like, it adds to the vibrancy of the city because yeah, for sure. it's not just that they're opening up retail and and um restaurant Change. spaces they're right. also but they're bringing in residents. Right. People right. live here. They That's live in right. the city. Which so is wonderful. Every time they, you know, like the wharf is a great example. I mean, what's on the bottom of the wharf, the retail and restaurants and et cetera, are not necessarily for all the people who are living upstairs, yeah. right? The hotels and whatever. Maybe more for the hotels. Because mm-hmm. to me, the wharf is a little touristy mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, And the tourists are there, and that's yeah. great. Like they built it for the right reason. <laughs> but, you know, when you think of Shaw, Shaw is really indicative of like a neighborhood in DC. Yeah. And even though they built some beautiful um, residential places, some gorgeous apartment buildings that, you know, that whatever you want to call the complex where uh, the giant is, yeah, the convivial is, but like it really is an incredible mixture of retail, restaurant, and residences, which is going to bring people here yeah, to absolutely. eat. Yeah, you yeah. know? So it's. Which has been super cool for us to be a part of because right? so many people like Chef Cedric of Convivial mm. and Eric and them are unconventional. And then, yeah, all and, the you know, way Michael down from Red Hat and Black all and these people. Alley too, and the like, speed of, like, they yeah. all used to come to Chaplains and they, you know, they saw the vibrance of, like, you know, what was happening on that corner and also up from the convention center. And, like, you know, they, some of them used to be our regulars and then would ask our, you know, ask us what we thought of the neighborhood or whatever. And some just, I don't know, had a great premonition and instinct right. about opening there, et cetera. But everyone has been collaborative in opening in our area. It hasn't been about competition. I mean, like, everyone was kind of, yeah, so. like I think really like everyone was waiting for Marriott to activate 9th yeah. Street, right? Yeah. They were just sitting on right. all that, 
on all that real estate. Which, honestly, the convention center. I mean, right. Yeah. And the, the convention, convention center. center. That supports yeah. a lot of people further down from us. We don't get as much. But it just yeah, made people walk range. down. They don't right. walk yeah. up right. as much. That's but right. But, like, you know, some of the bigger conventions we like get. Like Comic-Con. We Comic-Con's get flooded. Amazing. Yeah. We get yeah. frost for that. Man. It's <laughs> no, awesome. Yeah. They that like ramen. <laughs> they like, yeah, we get to. Well, but the price point of ramen. I mean, let's talk about, I mean, you're talking about the price point. You know, ramen is a specific price point. Yeah. So that is going to appeal to the certain masses. people. And we right? tried yeah, yeah. keeping it as what, what, like where we started at the same, those price mm-hmm. points. And we've, you know, it's been a, the pandemic definitely hit and really affected the cost of goods, which really made, yeah, you know, the price really points well. challenging. And we've still tried to keep things as like low as possible and competitive as possible for the people that we set out to serve, which is like the neighborhood and the industry. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, the reason we serve so late, the reason we're there so late every night is also for all of our friends that serve and bartend. To get and off work and, and want to want to get cook. something. To, like that was like in the beginning for the first year and a half, like we were just staying open late for no reason. Yeah. Like we were just no keeping the kitchen open no matter until they started yeah, coming until, until they, they started, started coming like, and realized that mouth, we could do it every day and, no matter what and yeah. you know we never we're open 365 days a year at wow. all, both of our places and we don't close for holidays and we're open to last call every night at Chaplin's that'll never change that's mm-hmm. just it's just kind of part yeah, of who we are and really, it's not always economically amazing no Adrian but it's, our partner, it's the identity but, it's, it's but it's like is part working part. for you oh absolutely yeah, okay I mean, so now that you have these two places you also have gone off in your separate directions. Mm-hmm. Was that a difficult conversation for the two of you to like be like, listen, we have this partnership and we're doing these things, but hey, man, I want to go and do. I think X it's just kind y. of like organically kind yeah. of happened, and like I think it's healthy for us to yeah. kind of like to explore like our own options or other options. We had to grow up a little bit. Yeah, we kind of like we can't like be like. Uh, we can't like be uh, best friends, roommates, and business partners, our wives like, and, and brothers for forever, cool. like, right. Without like it getting in the way of like our marriages or relationships. Yeah. I don't know. I think that and just growing. I mean, I yeah. think like as we've gotten a little older, like to be honest, we never had a conversation. Yeah, we never. Because there really was never had. really something. That, well, who like, did something on their own first? Was it you or you? I don't know. Actually, uh, it was kind of similar. Kind timing. of similar timing. Like, yeah, like we, like, were, Micah was starting to work on his consulting stuff mm-hmm. at uh, like another hotel. We were starting to look at the Makoto space on MacArthur and with our chef Ogawa from Zeppelin. Right. And you know, like you know, for that space, it was very much about like you know a very small, very little niche omakase tasting menu spot there wasn't really a lot of beverage involved and it was in my neighborhood and i also i know how micah feels about the suburbs it's yeah, not I'm, really his jam so i mean i love palisades i mean that is still the city i just want yeah. to say <laughs> it's really nice <laughs> uh, i've heard i've heard some of our guests from hailing from like columbia heights have referred to uh, palisades as the boonies which i was like okay <laughs> seriously no it's not that's ridiculous that's rough that's, they're just trying to get under your skin they're just trying to be a hip city dwellers. right exactly right. no i totally get that okay so you went that route but you sort of you were doing more consulting yeah because like just, you worked with your wife at yours truly yeah like we did that as like kind of a a test um, to see like how compatible we were like mm-hmm. in this under the same roof uh, when under pressure. Sure. And uh, I mean, I work with my husband. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but that went really well. Like that was just amazing in the beginning. Like working with all these talented bakers, like Camilla and from Pluma, and mm. uh, like just like all Johanna's entire team uh, at Mercy Me was. Just a, really a lot of fun, and that's where I found uh, I met Hunter Douglas, who I started Boom Daddy Hospitality with, okay. and um, and then just kind of met Ian White and grew that, and in the under uh, on the Mercy Me project, and then kind of like started doing our own thing mm-hmm. uh, and outside of Chaplin's and Zeppelin, uh, just because uh, yeah, I'm not like one of those people that enjoys uh, just like doing the same thing routines kind mm-hmm. of uh 
make me feel I will always want to be like progressing and well, you have to stretch. doing something new. And uh, you know, the we had a lot of interest in duplicating chaplains and Zeppelin multiple I mean uh, a lot. We I'm sure we everybody has knocked on your doors. Do we weren't sure that that's who we wanted to be. You know, we a lot of people <laughs> like call chaplains their first date their first mm -hmm. you know they're like they got married from meeting there and they whatever and it's it's like nostalgic and special and it's like you know doing another one we feel like detracts from that and so we were it was kind of like only natural for us to start doing things outside of that and we also are still like that's still our home base i mean micah's still yeah, there true. all the time yeah, i'm still there all the time and you know we branch out and do these other things, but like those are our main, those are our main, you know, that's like, like they will main, always yeah, be focus, our fo primary but, focus just because yeah. that's where we started. Really. Well, I love that. And I would, I really, I'm thrilled to hear that you're not thinking of trying to replicate, especially chaplains and even Zeppelins because they're so unique Yeah, and you know, it, it would lose its lot. Like I don't need a chaplain someplace else. Right. Like I would rather you do a different concept. Exactly. And that's sort of how I know. That's for, how we feel. Too. I know yeah. why people do do that. Yeah. I understand the ease. If you have a machine and it makes yeah. money and you're yeah. like, I can pop it here and it yeah. makes sense. Exactly. But even Steven Starr, like, listen, Park in New York is, a, I mean, in Philly is incredible. It's very low diplomat. They're yeah. the same. But he did enough, enough tweaking. little tweaking yeah. to make Le Dip feel for like, DC. Right, right. Not yeah, right. like he just took the same concept right. and plotted it someplace right. else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which I think really says a lot about like, you know, understanding a neighborhood and mm -hmm. reading, totally. the, the, reading the, the clientele, like the people you're catering to. Cause you're, you, let's face it. Like we all pick our borough because we like, we all have different tastes and interests. And that's the beauty of DC. Now it's like, you have this whole spectrum of, mm -hmm. you know, of, I mean, it's so diverse now. That's yeah. what I love about it. But we are also a very finicky... DC is a finicky dining mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, consumer. Yeah. They're educated. They have money. Yeah. Not all of them, but a lot of people. Or they put their money towards their dining, and they are educated about food and food quality. Um, and we don't... I, I'm very interested to see with some of the things that are coming in the pike that are opening up here um, that are not unique for DC, whether or not they thrive and survive, because you've seen, we've seen lots of big names come down here, open up these concepts that don't speak to the community, yeah. and then they don't last. Yeah, right. So, and I'm not wishing ill will on anyone. I'm, no, the more you bring not. in, the better, I'm right. here for it. Um, but I's I'm very interested to see. So, show's gotta wrap up at some point. Let's just talk about quickly, like what's down the pike for you guys, either together or separately in the next year or two. Yeah, well. How I'm, many more children? Uh, wifey wants another or two. I'm oh, going yeah. with no more. Yeah. You have um, three? We have three, yeah. yeah. That's good. Three's a good number. And Micah yeah. and Johanna have one. And yeah. I think they're I think one we're, and done. We're, we're, we're good right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think we're... Well, he's we're, how old is he? Is he three? Yeah. I think one is great. Like, I think we're really happy <laughs> yeah. with him. He's, well, you could go over there. They're cousins, that's right? right? I mean, they do. It's they enough. Do. It's enough. He, they bring, um, and so, yeah, I think uh, from like a professional standpoint, Mike and I probably wind up doing stuff together again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, small things that like we passion projects that we've talked about for 20 years now. And, you know, getting back together on some things and, you know, he will do other things, I'm sure. And, you know, we are focused on our project on MacArthur currently. And then my wife and I are doing a place in Georgetown. It'll open pretty soon, but really more focused for her. Mm -hmm. um, because, Can you just tell us quickly about this? What you're yeah, it's called Le Bon Bosch. It's the good cow. And it's um, like a little bistro, French bistro burger mm. spot in um, Georgetown <laughs> where the old booty monger used to be. Fantastic. And what are we thinking? Like so we're summer? hoping we'd love to be open for Bastille Day, but we'll oh, see. Okay, but great. that's that's aggressive. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and you? Um, yeah, like I, you know, I think Ari and I, like he said, have some still some really great ideas and some things to do. Uh, but uh, in the immediate, like I, Johanna, my wife, and I have been working on something special. It's on the horizon um, mm -hmm. that I can't wait to talk to you about at dinner tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right, because I'm going to love Mikado tonight. Yeah. All right, lastly, before we wrap up, I just want to bring this up because I was doing some research on you guys. Not like I don't know about you, but I found an article that Holly Simmons did with you when you opened up Chaplains, mm -hmm. and she asked you some really random questions. Um, one of the questions was, what's something you're bad at? And you said relationships. Mm -hmm. And you said day jobs. Uh, so yeah. how would you be bad at that if you never had one? Um, we used to not wait it just didn't. Really. Yeah, it just <laughs> didn't sound really appealing. So it, it's just something I, I knew I never wanted. Okay, she asked you, who would you play in a movie? Do you remember? Who do you? All right, so Did who would you play in a movie Val now? Kilmer no, Kilmer. you said Val Kilmer. Oh wow. <laughs> Uh, maybe Gary Oldman or Daniel Day-Lewis. No, you said Kiefer Sutherland. Wow. Oh, wow. Look at you, man. That seems like I you feel would like we say that. I switched. Yeah, she I think switched that she us. switched it. We know each sure. other too well. All right, we'll call oh, Holly on us. Kiefer Sutherland. I'm, There's they do that no a lot. way. Yeah. That's hilarious. Val <laughs> Kilmer definitely That's what is what we did. Lost definitely. Boys and the Doors. Yeah. And that I mean, was like seriously. our jam back in the day. Okay, who's the concert pianist? Micah. Yeah, yeah. And violinist? Me. Yeah. And do you still play? Um, I do, yeah. I've been like playing with uh, my son, Luca. Yeah. And you? I wish. Okay. I have no idea. You let it go. I, there's no way I could still play. Okay. Um, prize possession. Let's do prize possession then and prize possession oh my today. Gosh. Then? Maybe like our... Our, our bikes, like we used to ride <laughs> everywhere, dude. Got we didn't set. have much back then. Like, yeah, those, we're, I mean, Chaplin's was definitely our prize our possession, prize man, possession for man. sure. But that okay. was, that was like our, chap was this before? No, it's when it was opening, yeah, 2014. That was, definitely, that was like, we went all in on that. That I'm was like sure everything was, we had. I'm sure we said something ridiculous. No, I think what you said was interesting. You yeah. said my creativity. Uh, okay. Well. And you said our family and our relationship. Great. Those are pretty yeah, dope. Out of all our answers, That's I like That's much those. better than a bike, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Way better. Um, and the last question was, what would you do with an extra hour a day? So let's do then and now. Okay. Then you said sleep. Yeah. And you said you were working on your relationships. Clearly, That's dude, terrible. you had some things going on for yeah. you. Um, what about today? What would you do with an extra hour today? I'd definitely probably spend a little bit more time. With honestly, with like I, I don't see Micah very often mm -hmm. or Luca, which would be nice. We both work a lot, so we don't really spend that much time together anymore. That would probably be it, or with my kids mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I mean, similar answer as well. Family for yeah. sure. Okay. I think it's like you know, I think number one uh, because it's like it grounds us and makes us feel, yeah. uh, you know, just it makes it all worth it. I think. Yeah. I love that. All right. Well, can we tell everybody where to find you, either on Insta or online? Where do you want people to find you guys? Um, I mean, yeah, Chaplin, Chaplin DC, Chaplin, mm -hmm. Chaplin DC, okay. yeah, Capo, DC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Love Makoto, Lardente, all, all right. Look conventional. Up. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's. that's we we run a circuit. Yeah. All right. Well, everything you heard here today, you can find on the listareyouwanted.com. Of course, if you follow me at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on YouTube, please subscribe. You can find all that there. You can see every show that I've done here at The Wine Lair on YouTube. And of course, you can download it on all podcast sites. I want to thank you guys. It's so good catching up with you. Thank you for you joining That's me really today. Nice, yeah. And thank you for joining me today. Um, be safe out there and have a delicious week. Produced by HeartCast Media.